Beach in South Bay. We are about to commence the 2023 Surfers Walk of Fame induction ceremony. Today and this weekend, we honor the past, we celebrate the present, and inspire the future of our surfing South Bay culture. Thank you to everybody who made it out last night for the awards ceremony as well as the movie premiere. We had over 500 people in the theater. Those of you who know the community center theater, 500 surfers, drums, uh, inductees, industry leaders, you name it, everybody was there celebrating what we do, and that's surfing. So thank you for those who attended. If you missed it, look on Instagram or Facebook, you'll see, you'll see what you missed out on. With their two hands, these master craftsmen revolutionized the surf world with their surfboard building techniques. JC and Steve's passion for manufacturing has allowed professional surfers to catch some of the biggest waves in the world and introduce millions of new surfers over the decades into this lifestyle we call surfing. Without surfboards, there'd be no surfing. And for that, we thank you. Right now, I'd like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies, the 2004 Surfers Walk of Fame inductee, South Bay legend, and all-round awesome guy, John Joseph. Yeah! Thank you, Lonnie. This is uh, our 19th year of having this, and it's amazing that it still lasted. Uh, Roger Bacon, when he founded this in 2003, it was amazing, and it's grown into this now. Initially, it was just a few people in chairs right here. Now look, look behind you. It's fantastic what's going on. Uh, before I get started, uh, I would like to uh, do something that we normally don't do. Uh, we lost someone that was really, really important to, the, to our culture here. Uh, you've all seen him here, the guy with the big handlebar mustache and the camera, uh, who did a lot of uh, movie stars, athletes, and surfing. Mike McIntyre, we lost about two months ago. Uh, he had uh, COPD and he succumbed to it. And uh, it was a, really a big loss that hit a lot of us very hard. Uh, right now, though, I would like to introduce all of our inductees that are on the pier, please. Guys, could you stand, please? And I'll introduce you one by one. So if, if you have a plaque on the pier, come on, just stand up. I'll start over here on my left. We have in the hat and the green shirt, John Whitney Gill. Next to him, you know, in front of him, is Don Craig up from San Clemente. Next to him is John T. from Donna Beach. In the back row, the very back guy uh, that is something shining off of his head is Sonny Bartman. Next to him is Pep Ike. Then we have the always young looking John Baker from Malibu. <laughs> Folks, he lived, he had the life that we all dreamed of. For 25 years, he was a head lifeguard at Malibu. <laughs> yeah, it's Bakersfield now. <laughs> and next to him is Chris Bredesen. <laughs> then down, down, down on the front row, on my right now is Kip Jurger. Next to him is a inductee from two years ago, Pat Ryan, AKA Gumby. And last, but definitely not least, is probably the most recognized surfer from the South Bay ever. Uh, someone we've all known to love, Mike Purpose. Besides Mike, uh, Mike McIntyre's passing, uh, someone that was up here last year, Nick Christensen, we lost him to cancer last year, so he won't be here. Uh, right now, there are 96 inductees here on all the plaques. Uh, there's 54 that have survived, and most of the pioneers, I think there's only one pioneer left out of the 34, and that's uh, Rosemary Reamers, and she was trying to get down here from Santa Cruz, but she was unable to come, and wanted to pass on her congratulations to the uh, inductees. 
so now we'll, there's a couple of people in the crowd I need to introduce. First of all, we have a couple of really big, big time serving champions. We have Peter Townsend, 1977 world champion, right over here. Somewhere out there, at least I saw him earlier this morning, is Alima Kalama, who won the United States Surfing Championship in 1960. Right here with the hat on, with the red band. There's Alima. And then uh, one last person that we have that, if you ever surf Trestles or San Onofre, is Brian Bent coming up from here. He rides an old coupe. He's a kid, but he rides an old coupe box. Basically a plywood surfboard. It's hollow. He has a skipper's cap on down there. He's, he's dressed appropriately. To give you some perspective, between the two of them, it's shaped over, shaped or glass for 200,000 so forth. Literally, they've both been doing it for about 50 years, and it's not the pop-out crap that they're sending in from China. These are hand, hand shaped on foam and hand glass on the surfboards. And but it's 200,000 and if you go with John Leninger, who probably sold about half of them, it would be over 300,000. Oh, no, I'm sorry. These, if you've noticed, this is the first time I've worn these. I, honest to God, I just got new glasses because I couldn't see the guys in the back row last year to announce them. So I'm, I'm, anyway, the, the first, our first guy we're gonna honor is, is John Carper, AKA JC. And speaking for him uh, will be Joe K from Billabong. Joe? Well, it's an honor to be here. In 1975, I'm like making myself really old, I was working down at Rick James Surf Shop in San Clemente. And that was when Rick James came out of the Gregnell factory here in South Bay and opened up a shop off of Pico. And uh, this is the same Rick James that behind the counter there was a little Dixie cup and there was a thumb. Inside of it, you thought, oh, that's like a fake thumb from a prop store, but it turned out that it was his real thumb and that he had outlined a blank and he took the saber saw and went this way and cut his thumb off and Greg Knoll thought it would be a great practical joke to throw it in a little Dixie cup of resin and so they raced uh, Rick James back to the hospital and they said, well, we can sew your thumb back on, but uh, the resin was already going off and that was uh, behind the counter. I'm up here like honoring you know John because this is the soul of the industry. The stories that you're going to hear out of John are the real deal. It's not the corporate. It's not authentic brands. It's not Oak Tree Capital. It's not board writers. You know, if it wasn't for John, if it wasn't for Steve Mangeli, um, if it wasn't for Gumby, if there wouldn't be any surf industry. I mean, all of it is just smoke and mirrors because shapers are held to such a high demand when they outline a blank and you get it in the water. If the board doesn't work, I mean, you're not going to like bullshit and say, hey, oh, it's a great board, you're never going to write it again. You're going to tell them straight up to their face, say, you know, the board doesn't work, it isn't magic. And so, really, this is about who creates the magic here. There's a, a, no surfboards, no industry. Um, John used to have the saying because he would come over from Hawaii and stay at our home and, and I'd like, see him when he'd get back I'd say, John, how many boards did you shape today? And he goes, well, I don't know, I shaped like a ton of them. And I go, and this was like before you had computers scanning and, you know, the CAD cutters. John was hand shaping, outlining, you know, skill 100, you know, sure form, you know, fine sanding. And so I go, well, John, did you do five boards? Well, I did way more than five boards. Did you do 10? Oh, I did way more than 10. And, you know, did you do 20? Oh, I think I did more than 20. And it turned out like he did 36 boards that day. And he would do this day in and day out when he was staying here on the mainland shaping boards. And these were all handmade. And then John would have would go to the trade shows with Don Craig, because Don was repping his boards for HIC. Um, you know, John would go, yeah, you know what, I'm just like making Dixie cups. That's all I'm doing. I'm making like anybody can. And, and he, John is self-depreciating, and John certainly doesn't make like styrofoam cups by any stretch. And those are pop-up boards. And, and John um, had shaped 10 boards identical off the um, computer 
and when they come off the computer, it's like a potato chip that has like ruffles, right? And so you still have to find sand if you so the tolerance is probably, I don't know, a quarter of an inch at most. So John shaped 10 boards that he thought was identical. Shane went out, wrote all 10, and there was one out of the 10 that was like super magic that he like uh, rode through successfully a number of heats at the OP Pro. So Shane was staying down in San Clemente. Shane throws the board in the back of this truck, goes down the 405, and wouldn't you know it, he didn't strap the board down. It like flies out of the back of the truck and just blows all over the freeway. And so, you know, John is like completely distraught going, you know how hard I, I shaped him 10 boards and out of 10 boards, only one of them was magic. And I mean, this is the sort of, you're talking about increments of a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch, you know, a sixteenth of an inch, a thirty-second of an inch. That's the difference between a magic board and a board that's good, but is it like magic? And so John is renowned for shaping magic boards. And so like I bumped into my purpose um, at the cove and I was with my wife and I said to Mike, you know, I'm getting pushback here about John being nominated. And uh, Mike goes, John was my hero in high school. Like if anybody like deserves it out of South Bay, John's roots are deep in South Bay. I mean, John won the 1967 the Metalock Surfing Championship. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, I mean, Metalock was the ceramic factory, and um, anyway, it, it, John has been living here in Hermosa, not Manhattan, not Redondo, but Hermosa, you know, all the way through from what, one years old up until 18, 19 years old? So John's roots go really deep all the way down into Mirror Post and, and John doesn't live in the past. I mean, John is, I mean, all of us that are fanboys that are wearing these shirts, I mean, John is the most super hyper stoked Grammy that I know. I mean, he's still shortboarding, and when he's having trouble, like, popping up to his feet, he's, like, watching YouTube videos and calling me on the phone. Joe, you gotta watch this video to, like, help you to pop up faster. So he's still riding a 510, and then he's foiling. And he's doing SUP. Um, we always joke with John and call him Johnny Lalane and not John Carper because he's just like so like like he stays over at my house and drives me nuts. To, you shouldn't be eating that. You should be eating gluten free. You should be doing these kind of push-ups. Like, oh, God, just shut up. But he, he's constantly pushing, you know, the envelope. And his wife Epsco is in the audience here, and she has a store in Haleiwa called Back in the Day that sells Hawaiian Vintage. And I guess the name of the store, Back in the Day, because you know, John is always saying, yeah, Back in the Day, back. but John doesn't live Back in the Day. John lives in the future and in the present. And he's my hero for sure, and certainly motivates me to be in the water, you know, three, four, five days a week, as much as I possibly can. He's like a little kid, and you know, this shirt, when I grow up, you know, I want to be a shaper. I can assure you, John has never grown up. So with that, John Parker. That's a hard act to follow. And, uh, Joe, the reason I don't talk about the past or think live in the past is I can't remember the past. <laughs> I've been here with a hundred people that I used to know real well, and I can't remember their name. I can't even hardly remember them. <laughs> so, but then they start talking, and I do. And, um, and by the way, Joe, it's not one quarter inch. It's one one thousandth of an inch accuracy. And what craftsman is not going to go for that, right? And they don't do what they do nowadays on, uh, you know, they have to have, you know, equipment just as good as an airplane wing. So, uh, I really want to thank you guys. I just can't even believe I'm here. It's just like, this is like a dream to me. I mean, I, I have a lot of dreams. 
you know, walking down Coast Guard. Uh, usually I don't have my clothes on or something like that in the train, you know? But, uh, at least my DVDs or something. But I just want to say, and I, this is, I'm really, if I'm not, I'm not mad or anything. I just don't get me wrong about this. But uh, I love the thing that I'm not a homos, I'm not a South Bay guy. And uh, I told one guy, nobody's more South Bay than me. Uh, about 1904, something around that, my Annie Maud and Uncle Jack Miller built a house on the beach and blocked down 910 Strand. There was like four houses, maybe 10 houses, in all of Hermosa Beach. The Zona, what's it called? My wife has to remind me. Zane's. That's my dad's building. He built that. That was the Hermosa Beach Music Center. Uh, we used to, Howard Rumsey used to leave the, we used to have, uh, in the back, in the, in the alley, had French doors, you know, two doors, and he'd, he'd leave that open so us kids could come and he'd have a milk crate on there, just on the side so we could put it and stand up and just barely look over and see like Ray Charles, I mean Quincy Jones, like every jazz great, Ramsey Lewis, every, every great jazz musician in the world played there. And I saw it. My father was a musician, played with all these guys. He played in there, and that used to be the mermaid. And I'd be three years old and dragged into it. It was a pretty stinky, sleazy bar. But my dad would play there at night, and then, you know, he'd, he'd drag me around with him and, and all that. And so I grew up in a combination of here in Hollywood. Uh, I was born in Torrance in 1947. We moved down to Hermosa um, on 10, 17th Street. Right off, off, not on the strand, but the, the, around the other side of the alley. The house is still there, and it's the most cute little Hansel and Gretel house you've ever seen. I, I, I actually had forgotten about this house, and I lived there until I was about five or something like that. And then we moved up to 24th Street. And I actually, it's funny, I've never forgotten the, the address of the Hermosa Beach House, 1414 uh, Hermosa. It's not there anymore, but the house. And there is, and then my Annie Maud's house, which I spent half of my life in, because my, both my parents were always working, so I had to be babysat my family. My Auntie Margot lived here. She was the original Auntie Maine, and uh, you might not know that. I won't go into that, but uh, she was eccentric to the max, you know. And uh, so I spent a lot of time there. My my dad was uh, he ran away from Canada when he was he grew up in Canada. He ran when he was 16 and ran down here, so he pretty much grew up on the beach here in, in uh, Hermosa Beach. And uh, so, uh, you know, just, I remember the insomniac. I saw Bob Dylan there, not play, like he was just hanging out. You know, and I, I looked down, I didn't even know for years, this, this guy's really different, man. He was really different, you know? And uh, so it's just like so much stuff. And I'd say that, you know, I grew up, I born in Torrance, Lived up till about, uh, I don't know, eight or something. I have to ask some of my friends what the dates were all this stuff. Uh, I don't bother about that stuff. <laughs> Mainly I can't, so I don't worry about it. I don't worry about, you know, forgetting stuff because I always tell my friends, look, you know, we, we used to take drugs to forget stuff and be stupid and silly, you know? So, you know, if I start forgetting stuff and talking s s gibberish, yeah, I'm ready for it. I've already had practice. And, uh, but just like we, and I had an examiner route, paper route, and we, I, at three in the morning I'd have to get up, and the examiner was a monstrous paper. But at three till six in the morning, South Bay was mine. I mean, nobody was up. I went all, oh, every back alley and everything. And uh, so anyway, then we, when I was uh, in second grade, I moved over to uh, Manhattan Beach and lived right across from Robinson School. And I got a couple of friends here, and I, I'm, I don't want to embarrass you guys or anything like that, but there's some guys there. Uh, <coughs> they cough, you know, I'm not used to the air here. Anyway, uh, John Van Blom, John Strickland. You don't have to stand up, but if you want to, but just raise your arm. And uh, that's John Van Vuong and John Strickland.
We were the three jars. We lived within a house or two of each other. And these guys, we were tight. We did everything together. And we all learned how to surf. I think John might have learned a little bit before us. But John's father was Slim Van Blanche. And if anybody belongs up here, it's Slim. But Slim's not alive anymore. But he he was original San Onofre uh, club founder. And uh, I mean, uh, they built a sailboat in their front yard. They had the coolest. God, John, don't you wish you kept those things? Those are probably worth hundreds of thousands of each. Redwood surfboards, hollow boards, and stuff like that. And, and they all, they, Mr. Van Blom took me and, and uh, Johnny Strictly under his wing and pretty much made watering out of us. And, uh, and so just these guys are just, we haven't, we've seen each other a couple times in the last 60 something years. This is the first time we've been together in 60 years. And uh, these guys look awesome, man. A couple old farts, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and John Van Blom is, he doesn't seem to get shorter. And there's his son over there, and it's just so cool. So I see so many friends, Mark Bowie, you know, I see uh, all of uh, Colin Sacco, and uh, Jim Rusi, you know, I've known him forever, and uh, Don Craig, now Don Craig and I, we went to school together, so we've known each other forever, and uh, he basically, when I started the JC thing over here, uh, I actually started off with HIC, Hawaiian Island Creations, and they sent me over, and I didn't know anything about the business. I'd never been in the surf shop, or to buy something, buy whack. I was too cheap to buy anything. But, uh, so he taught me the business, and he was a rep for HIC then, and he did, yeah, it was HIC, right? And he would drive me up and down to every store, and we'd go, uh, you know, uh, shake babies and kiss hands. I always <laughs> basically kiss butt. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody walked in. Every time I walk in, everything is the same thing. Was how's pipeline today? <laughs> and I, go, I don't know. It's been 30 years since I've paddled out there. Name and person, and he's virtually a, 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 a walking encyclopedia of South Bay. And uh, he lived all over South Bay like me. But uh, all the different places, either or bookstore up there, uh, just so much. I just remember, uh, you know, my dad's shop, my dad's store, uh, it had a little, there's a little balcony over it. My dad used to organize the uh, 1912 days, and uh, we'd all sit out there and watch the old cars go by. They'd all dress like people from 1912 and stuff. You should bring that back, it was actually super fun. But, uh, and then, um, so anyway, the, I don't, I just really uh, wanted to kind of keep this, uh, you know, South Bay as much as possible. Hawaii, we don't have, we don't have, we've had three or four weeks we can, we can finally get to Hawaii. But uh, when I, I used to hang out at uh, in my paper route, I got to know Gene Sedillo. Very few people remember him. He had a Hermosa Beach uh, surfboards on, on Hermosa Beach Boulevard. And when, I kind of forget the name, but Hermosa Beach Boulevard, the one that's right out front here. Avenue, yeah, Hermosa Avenue. They have too many Hermosa Avenues and Boulevards. I can't remember all that stuff, you know. But anyway, he had a little shop, and it was, it was. Uh, he had the Hawaiian connection. Donald Takayama, Chubby Mitchell, uh, Diva, all the old guys, you know, Hawaiian guys would hang out there all day. And you know, he had these cool pictures of Makaha and you know stuff like that. And up there, he, I won't go in. He was. A, oh, by the way, Pat O'Connor was on the list. Mike Bright, of course. Pat O'Connor, I was still, I was mad at him all my life. I still am. You know, he's not alive, I'm sure. But he, uh, he married my second grade teacher from Robinson High School or Robinson Elementary, second grade, Miss Flood, who I was madly in love with and swore when I grew up, we're gonna, she's gonna want to marry me, you know? <laughs> so I just, uh, you know, and then he, he was the first guy to uh, make uh, the uh, Canyons Point, Mossel and Pat O'Connor, they went down there. Yeah, I think it was maybe Search for Surf, the other. Now, last night, going to the Pier Avenue, and I remember seeing all the Search for Surf, uh, Greg Noll movies in the 50s there. And we always used to wear Hirachis, Levi's with the little 
tuck, tucked under her thing of the white. I noticed one of the kids in the ward last night was wearing that style, man. Right on, brother, right on. And, uh, and you know, everything had to be perfect. You had your uh, Converse or your Purcells. You were allowed to wear two, sh two tennis shoes, Converse or Purcells. And I, I'm not sure which one was the coolest. I think Converse sort of won eventually. But uh, you had the Pendleton, you know, extra large. And, you know, you're about 100, like 90 pounds. And the thing came down past your knees. And uh, we wore those Mexican Rockies, and they put tacks in the bottoms of them. And they didn't have uh, the rugs in, on the piles. And they just turned the top, and they'd run down and just, just you just sparks coming out of your shoes, you know? And everybody do it, and the guys that were running out were just like, stop the movie, stop the movie. <laughs> So, just my, some of my best memories, and this, this event here has just really brought them back. So, uh, it's just so neat to see, and see all these people, and John Baker, and you, you know, you're still looking 100, just, he's probably the best looking guy I've ever posted anyway. But, uh, I just, it's just, I just am so honored, and I was really sort of didn't want to come, because, you know, I'm not, I, it's, anybody that knows me doesn't understand how I was so painfully shy back then. And it wasn't until I got married to my wonderful wife, Atsuko, and had Zach, my son, right over there. Put your arm up in the air. Any of you guys are in the punk, surf punk music? That's Fiddler. He's the singer for Fiddler, which means F it, Dad, life's a joke. Or, life, life's a rich. F, it's not Fiddler, it's Fiddler. It's an acronym for F it, Dad, life's a risk. And when he says it, it sounds better than when I say it. <laughs> And then my daughter Alice is cruising around. She's a professional photographer. Oh, there she is with goofy glasses. Her husband Ryan. Uh, and, uh, and just uh, so neat seeing all my friends. Uh, Jay was one of our uh, managers, JC Roy over here. I saw Jamie Polinetti somewhere. Pretty sure it was him. He's super fit, man. You know? He's always an athlete. Uh, so many guys I, I grew up with and know. And sorry, I don't remember. You know, I forget to tell, say your names right now. But uh, but I, like I say, Greg Noel did inspire me. And uh, we just watch him, but we couldn't say a word. And if we said a word, they chase us and pants us. You know, that was a big deal. All the big guys used. To, I mean, half these guys probably did chase me and pants me. There are some people here older than me. And uh, they probably chased me and did pass me. But some, that was a big deal back then. I don't know. I don't think that's politically correct to do anymore. But, uh, so, so anyway, uh, is there anything else, Esco? She's my my brain. Am I okay? I said, don't go on. <laughs> but there's so much stuff I want to say. It just comes like an avalanche of just memories. And uh, I see so many people I know, and it's just crazy. And so I say that, you know, you might get old. You're all going to get older. You know, you, know, you're not, you can't defy gravity. Gravity is eventually going to win. But uh, you can stay immature all your life. Well, I want to thank you guys. And anything I forgot, please forgive me. There's all sorts of things I'm supposed to tell people. And uh, if, if the next guy is a legend shape a glasser. And, oh, before he comes up, I want to say, oh yeah, Junior, my glasser of all time, and and um, Jeff Madsen, my shaper of all time. You know, these guys there, Jim, the Sanders, the glasses. So grumpy. These guys are going real. You just get a bunch of blowhards like me. We go out there and smile and stuff like that. And you know, shape, I mean, shaping a lot of boards is hard, but shaping a board isn't that hard. It's not like, you know, it's, it's like carpentry or something like that, any kind of you know, trade job. But, uh, so, but the glassers are the guys, those are the ones, those are the guys in the pit that make the work. Because no matter what I would make, yeah, I would say, you know, uh, a, a good glasser won't make a bad shape good. But a bad glasser can make a good shape bad. So without a good glass job, that, I mean, you're the last guy to touch that book. And if it doesn't come out perfect, it ain't gonna rock. And, uh, so I always respect them because very, I mean, I can, now it's kind of cool that actually is glassers and sanders and some different awards, and they just sort of the most. All right, well, God bless you guys. Thank you.
Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Those stories came flooding out, and I think we all had an amazing history lesson. And I'd like to thank Marty Cam for catching all of that and documenting it, and Vince Ray. They're here every year capturing these special stories. Thank you. Let's hear it for JC. And now I'd like to bring up John Leninger to speak on behalf of Steve Mangelli. Well, I'm not a public speaker, but bear with me. It's an honor for me to introduce Steve Mangelli. He's been glassing here for 50 years. He's uh, married to Teresa. They have three, three kids, accomplished kids. Hermosa Beach is the Napa's center for surfboard building in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. More boards were built in just one square mile than any place in the world. Boards were shipped out of here like crazy. The East Coast was starting to develop developed some board companies, but everyone wanted to California boards. This is where the, all the action was, and all the boards were being built. During the 70s, Steve Mangelli was making, building 100, building, classing 100 boards a week. And I don't even know if people do that, that kind of numbers anymore. And during that time, we figured that the 70s were mostly long boards. The short boards were just starting to come into in popularity, but doing 100 boards a week, long boards a week was tremendous. I don't know if people can do that now. In 1980s, Steve Mangelli, Phil Becker, and Dave Hollander opened up Becker Surfboards. And then Steve opened up Mangelli Manufacturing, a glass shop. Estimated, Steve during his career is estimated he's glassed between 80,000 and 100,000 surfboards. Uh, What's unusual is in all these years, the glass process hasn't changed much. It's still done basically the same way as it was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It hasn't changed that much, but the quality is unbelievable. Sometimes I look at the boards that are coming out now, I can't even believe that they're handmade. They're so perfect. But it's just impressive the work that's being done. Even though some of the materials have changed a little bit, you know, carbon fiber has been coming to play. Some of the foam has changed a little bit. But basically, it's still the same way done. You know, the boards are being done now as they were in the 40s, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Steve has glass for quite a few different shops, a lot of different shapers, real premier shapers, real premier uh, surfboard shops. Uh, when he when he started shape, uh, glassing, he was glassing for Rick Surfboards. He was glassing all the Rick Surfboards during that time. And then they, would, they opened up Becker Surfboards. He was glassing all the Becker Surfboards. And then he was glassing for numerous other other uh, surf shops in South Bay here. Uh, also a thing that's kind of unique, it's a Secret Service contract with Steve to build a, a presentation board with the, with the presidential seal for uh, Barack Obama. And it was presented to him and it had the presidential seal on it. Out of all the board makers in this country, they picked him to do it for him. Steve also built five boards for uh, Expo 70 was in, in Saka, Japan, the World's Fair. As the first time surfing was introduced to the World's Fair, they had a, a American division there at, uh, at the World's Fair showing what, what's popular in America. And surfing was right up in the forefront of, the, of uh, that World's Fair. So, uh, but they, they, he built five boards for that show. And they, so from that point on, and that was in Osaka, Japan, from that point on, Japan took off like crazy. They wanted to copy what was being done here. So surfing just took off in, in Japan. It's so popular now, it's unbelievable. Uh, okay, Steve still surfs when he gets a chance every day. And I'm just so glad to see Steve get the recognition he deserves. People, people don't realize what goes into the glassing. Unless you've done your own repairs and realize that then you become a great get appreciated what, what goes into classing a surfboard and just to make it come out as good as it is. I mean, these things are perfect. <laughs> so Anyway, I'm glad to see Steve get the recognition he deserves and I want to hand it off to Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. John and I have been friends for, and co-workers for over 50 years. And a thanks to my family, there you go, Teresa, John, Je Jesse, and Jenna, and all my friends that are here also. Uh, glad that you could make it. 
Today I want to acknowledge and thank the three guys that brought me into the surfboard industry. All three have their Walk of Fame plaques on the pier, but I'm so sorry they're no longer with us. They're Rick Stoner, Mike Bright, and Phil Becker. Yeah. Phil Becker passed away this past year. Uh, very sorry about that. It was in the late 60s that I was building surfboards in my parents' garage, and the one part of the process I hated was sanding the board after it was fiberglass. Uh, it's terrible. So what I did was take the board to the Rick factory and ask if they could sand it for me. On returning to pick up the sanded board, I was met at the door by a, a guy who asked who had built this board. Uh, I was a little worried, thinking he was going to pick apart the work I had done, but to my surprise, the first words out of his mouth were, do you want a job? That was Mike Bright, who was the glasser at Rick's at that time. I have to say it was always a dream of mine to work at a surfboard factory, especially a prestigious shop like Rick's was. I met Rick and got the okay and was at work the next day as Mike Bright's apprentice. For two years I was Mike's helper when one day Rick came into the shop and informed me that Mike was leaving to start his Malibu uh, dive shop. And uh, Rick asked if I, if I thought I could take over Mike's position as a laminator for Rick's and without hesitation I said absolutely. Bill Becker was the shaper at that time, and I later found out he and Rick would check on my work every day after I had left, and I guess the work I was up was up to their expectations, and I had the job. Not more than a year or two after I took over, tragically, Rick passed away from an unexpected medical issue. Soon after, the Rick business was sold to new owners who we continued making the boards for. Within the first year, the new owners came to Phil and myself and asked if we had interest in buying the factory, part of their business. We jumped all over that, and this was the start of Mangelli Manufacturing and Phil Becker surfboard shaping in late 1975. I was 24 at the time. Phil was shaping, I was glassing, and Dave Hollander was doing the pin lines and gloss coats. We continued making boards for the new owners of Rick's and other shops and shapers in the area, notably Canoa Sir. Thanks to Tuzo and Kip Jerger, uh, we did Natural Progression in Santa Monica and local shapers Pat Reardon, Wayne Okamoto, Bruce Grant, Mike Guyvin, just to name a few. We went on for a few years with the idea of opening our own store being kicked around. We decided it would be a great it would be great to control our business for manufacturing all the way through the retail sales in our own stores. We decided to go for it and wanted to open as soon as we could and we set out to find a spot on PCH but couldn't find what we wanted. Most of all the shops at that time were on PCH and I believe it was Dave that found a nice building with plenty of parking actually on Pier Avenue that had been a laundromat. We took the risk of not being on PCH and the corner and the corner of Pier and Monterey became Becker Surfboards. It was one of the best moves we probably ever made. So we were off and running. Dave and John Leninger running the store, Phil and I making the boards. Dave and John were the premier salesmen and buyers in the industry at that time. We couldn't have asked for anything better than the two of them running the store. Dave was really the driving force, pushing the retail, the Becker retail forward. The two of them, over time, led us to having seven stores from Malibu down to Encinitas and our web store in Florence. At the same time, Phil and I were working like crazy to supply all the stores with the volume of boards that we were selling. Probably 80 boards a day, at the, a, a week at that time, sorry. We could never have done this without the crew I had. They and are, and are the best in the industry. Notably, the Bacarona family, Oscar, Jimmy, and Jose, who worked for me for so long. Steve Burdett, known as Bertie, who started working with me in the late 70s, actually, 
and is still down there to this day as the premier glasser he is. Fred Williams, the best polisher ever, and Dave Suda, the airbrush artist he is, are both still working at the factory. So with Dave and John pushing the retail forward, and Phil and myself and crew pumping the boards out, we went through the 80s, the 90s, and in the new century at this crazy pace with, with no let up. It was in 2007 that Phil came to Dave and myself and let us know that he was ready to retire. And Dave and I bought Phil out at that time. And Phil retired to Hawaii, which was a dream of his for a long time. Dave and I continued on and in 2011, we were approached with an offer we couldn't ignore to sell the Becker chain of stores, which we did to Billabong that year. That was the end of us end of an unbelievable period of crazy fun business that never let us down especially my crew and all the employees at the becker shops also a huge shout out to all of them to this day we still have the surfboard factory owned by my son john he is building his own brand of board mangeli surfboards With several new young employees, along with Bertie, Fred, and Davey, the shop is carrying on fine. John has brought in a youthful perspective of surfboard theory with solid shaping and surfboard construction. This crew will be down there for a long time, carrying on at 640 Cypress here in Hermosa. Thank you. Spider Fest, Los Angeles' largest and most authentic free all ages surf festival. Thank you all for being here. The surf gods have smiled upon us today with this great weather. And uh, thank you, Parks and Rec, for making this all happen. So, for one last time, let's give it up for our, gla our glassing legends, Casey and Steve. Let's enjoy the rest of the day. Surf's up. <laughs> <laughs> 